Let me, let me pose you a question in the form of, there's a historian named Richard Drennan who wrote a book called Facing West, The, the Metaphysics of Indian Hating and Empire Building. And in, re, in, in response to the charge against Morton for trading guns, which was, you know, I mean, the King's Proclamation was not, it was not the force of law behind that. That was not a legal document, and Morton knew that. Mm -hmm. He was a lawyer. His responses to his, to his letters, yeah. Um, Drennan says basically, so what? He says, why not share your latest and best technology with your red friends so that you can thereby more efficiently share the wilderness together? Drennan says, alas, the Plymouth uh, philosophy was not one of sharing, it was one of colonizing. He says they were the cutting edge of an empire that was at that moment subjugating Ireland and working to apply that experience to the New World peoples. So consequently, it struck them as illogical to the point of madness, he says, to be arming the people that they knew they were eventually going to be despoiling of their lands, their culture, even their lives. Um, what I'm saying, what I'm asking then is how, how would you, as the, like an Indian spokesman, respond to that? Would you say that this is, that what Morton did, let's, like, we're not, there, there is no definite evidence that this is exactly what he did. Morton never really admitted, except in the Puritan journals, that he sold. In his own book he says, I'm not going to tell you whether I did or didn't do that. I want to know first who told you that to the Puritans. And they said, well, we're not going to tell you that. You know, it was back and forth legalistically. But again, what I'm saying is that, like, um, tell, me, tell me what you can add to that argument about so what. You know, was any, do you know of any records of, of harm being done against whites by the Indians who had these guns, etc.? There are no records at all. Uh, many people cite Bradford uh, as evidence that uh, the guns would be turned against the English. But Bradford, writing about these incidents when Morton is trading, Morton was trading around 1627, 28. Mm -hmm. Bradford's writing about 20 some years later, after the Pequot War. Mm -hmm. And he's looking back at the, t the times of the Pequot War and also the aggressions of the Narragansetts. Uh, uh, well, not really aggression, but their defensive posture against English expansion under their chief, Mayantonomo, who was trying to forge an, an intertribal alliance yeah. to stop English expansion. He, Bradford was using those incidents in the same paragraph as talking with Morton, as if Morton had caused all these Indians all over southern New England to become aggressive toward the English and use firearms against them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just Bradford digressing. And he often does that because he's writing 20 years after the fact. Or, or events that, not necessarily for propaganda reasons, but events tend to get collapsed, as you say. Yes, into, he's encapsulating a whole bunch of yeah. stuff. As if Morton was the origin of gun running in New England. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the French were doing it, the English fishermen on the coast of Maine were doing it. Yeah. So, you know, it was very common. And then by 1643, the Dutch were arming Indians on the Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. and always the impetus was the benefits of fur trade, mm -hmm. which were financing almost all of these colonies to a large extent. New Netherlands was being financed basically on fur trade. Mm -hmm. New France, fur trade. Plymouth and, and Massachusetts Bay and the other New England colonies, slightly different. They did trade with natives, but also they were plantations and plantations first, not trading posts. They were here to stay and live yes. and not just be a... Bringing their families with them. Yeah. That was the first thing. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it just you know, goes to the English economy at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people being forced off the land as the land is being used to pasture sheep for the wool industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So, uh, you know, looking at the larger picture, uh, yeah, you can say, so what to Martin? Uh, so what that he sold guns to the Indians? To native people, if you have a commodity that's yours and you want to trade it for something else, no one can tell you no. Usually you would not trade with your enemies. That was about the only kind of stricture against that or people that you're in hostility against. Mm -hmm. But even in times of peace, hostile forces not only traded with one another but intermarried with one another. We have many cases of Wampanoags and Narragansetts intermarrying during the times of peace. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Plymouth Colony is looking at it strictly from their own viewpoint. And since Plymouth Colony is generally used as the example of uh, English behavior, then naturally most people pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And they think of them as being right and honest and, and uh, fair, and that Morton was a libertine and, you know, irresponsible and uh, was creating a hazard for everybody else. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you use the word intermarriage there. And 
This is something we'd like to get at, at, at a little bit more um, in detail about uh, Morton's settlement, and particularly, particularly uh, uh, regarding the Maypole celebration that he held in 1627. I mean, this was, um, I mean, he had his, everybody knows that a, throwing a good party for your friends is a great way to foster better business. Mm -hmm. And he also had his political reasons, uh, i.e., like the same power structure or struggle that was going on in England was happening here. You know, the upper classes and the very lower classes in England were very much against the Puritan Revolution that was going on, of the middle class, you know, the, of the, the, the Plymouth people that had come here. Um, in other words, like throwing a party for his lower class, quote unquote, servants would have helped align the noble Mr. Morton more with his, with the people who could help him in his struggle against Plymouth. Okay? Um, but one of the significant things we see there is simply that uh, that kind of behavior led to perhaps a different America that might have come about, a, a sense of cultural marriage between the Indians and the Americans that has taken right up until now and is only beginning perhaps right now with some of the, you know, the wisdom that the Indians understand about the land, the continent, the human spirit, etc. And that I think uh, white patriarchal civilization desperately needs to understand. In other words, um, if I give you a quick example, I, when I went to this intertribal powwow at uh, uh, Pratt Farm last May, and that was the first time I had seen one, and the, the Indian rituals seem to, like, they, they, they move by stages and they progress, like, dancing is a part of prayer, you know, and that um, they invoked, like, the, they, they invoked the circle, and then they uh, welcomed the ancestors and all the four-leggeds and uh, uh, everything that, that builds and builds toward, like, a centering of the individual in the here and now. And how would that, maybe I'm saying a terribly complex way, how would the Indians have enjoyed a thing like that? How would they have found ritual like that enjoyable uh, in a maypole context? What, what would the Indians have found attractive about Morton just to say this guy is okay? And well, um, it was common for, and is common today, for Native people to uh, have other people at you know, their social gatherings, you know, invited guests and, you know, feasting and celebration. It's a way of establishing or reaffirming relationships. Um, curiosity probably would have been the first thing that would have drawn the Native people to Morton. For one thing, they were always, they were already clients of his. They were already trading with him. Mm -hmm. And here's a bunch of Englishmen that are far away from home that want to do something like they would do at home. I don't think that Morton's uh, erecting of a maypole was done in direct defiance of Plymouth Colony necessarily or solely. Mm -hmm. I think it was just simply the guys were doing something that they ordinarily did back home. Mm -hmm. It was an English custom mm -hmm. and they were celebrating their English custom and having a good time and uh, the native people that came around uh, were naturally invited. Well even Plymouth Colony had native people at some of their celebrations. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more of a political thing with them but even Native people would have understood that mm -hmm. because, you know, inviting people to p participate with you is making a political statement, mm -hmm. is accepting and, and reaffirming an, an alliance or a relationship, a bond. So uh, Native people would have felt very comfortable in being invited to anybody's celebration and also curious to see how they do their thing. They might have gone home and laughed about it and, you know, made fun of it, but, you know, when they were there, they were probably polite and participated and ate and if there was uh, alcohol flowing they would have probably drank and got drunk and you know done whatever came naturally. Contests, sure. Test of skill, all that kind of stuff. Certainly. Like that. But I don't think that the concept of cultural marriage applies here because Morton specifically states that he did not want to really observe Indian custom in his relationship with them. He insisted upon English custom. So he was an Englishman. And he expected the natives that came to him to follow his customs in his house. Mm -hmm. And whether when he went about um, amongst the native people in their communities, whether he followed native custom is doubtful. 